So um, maintaining long supply lines, uh, I come on after a couple of slides to why I've called uh, the talk like that. Uh, but um, uh, axons are the long parts of our neurons that transmit the signals from one end of the, of the nerve cell uh, to the other. And in humans, it can be as long as from the brain to the bottom of the spinal cord or from the bottom of the spinal cord to, to our muscles. So they, so they can be quite long, and uh, that's why it's called maintaining long supply lines. And we use fruit flies for this. And, uh, and so uh, my talk will be um, divided into a few parts, three parts actually, sorry, I deleted the fourth since I thought I might not have enough time. Um, uh, the first is why fruit flies, or Drosophila as they're called. So um, if you uh, want to study a biological problem, uh, one of the um, standard ways of doing it is to use genetics. Now what does genetics mean? Genetics means making mutations that, uh, uh, making mutant organisms uh, where you've made a change in the instructions of the organism, and that change in the instructions causes a change in its machinery. And by uh, seeing a change in machinery uh, and asking what goes wrong, then you can uh, work out a lot about what normally happens. And also, what goes wrong in any organism uh, uh, overlaps a lot with what goes wrong in our diseases. And, and so you can also learn a lot about what goes wrong in diseases as well. So it's a bit like uh, to learn how a car works, uh, you might uh, uh, have a mutant that lacks the spark plugs. And okay, some mutations just won't go, but a mutation that lacks the spark plugs, probably the starter motor will go, but the engine won't ignite. And, and so that tells you something about the, the function of the spark plugs. And it's the same uh, with, with, with genetics. Now, a lot of genetics is um, uh, because you cannot um, pre uh, define what the mutation is, you might often have to make a large number of mutations, uh, maybe thousands or tens of thousands, and then screen for the one that, uh, uh, that you want. For example, if you're interested in how the starter motor works, or sorry, how the ignition works uh, in a car, you might have to make lots and lots of cars off the assembly line, uh, all with slightly different mutations in them, and, and just test them one by one, and see what are the cars where the starter motor works okay with the battery, but not the ignition. And that, and those mutations, will actually tell you something about how the, igni how the uh, ignition of the, um, um, of the um, car engine works. So, so to do um, genetics, uh, often means having large numbers uh, of organisms that you can handle easily, that are convenient pets to keep in the lab, uh, easy and fast to breed in large numbers, and if possible, harmless. So uh, organisms like these uh, are not uh, suitable, uh, but organisms like these are. Uh, and, um, and that's one reason why so many people uh, work with uh, Drosophila. Actually, um, that we just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the very first edition of the journal Genetics, uh, January 2016. Uh, sorry, January 1916. Um, and uh, one of the articles in that, uh, it's, I actually read it and it was a pleasure to read, was um, evidence that genes are carried in chromosomes, which until that time was, 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 was very um, uh, controversial. But it's a beautiful paper, actually. If any, if any of you fa fancy reading it, it's probably tough going, um, but if any of you know a bit of genetics, it's, it's, it's probably manageable. And uh, as someone said, it probably makes a lot more sense uh, 100 years later than the biochemistry papers at that time do, do, do nowadays. So, so, um, so that's, what a, that's a female Drosophila. Um, how about growing Drosophila? Uh, for the, it's a little bit pixelated, uh, but the life cycle of Drosophila uh, is about 10 days. And, uh, and I don't have a pointer here, do I? Um, uh, but I do have a pointer in my bag, which I should have taken out. Sorry about that. So, um, uh, this is the mating. Um, uh, the male courting the female. After they mate, the female lays her egg and fertilizes it. Uh, the egg uh, grows into larvae on, on, on this um, uh, medium. The, uh, then the larvae uh, are like little eating machines that eat and eat and grow and grow for about five days and then form uh, uh, pupae uh, where you then have metamorphosis uh, and about five days later the adult hatches and the whole thing starts again. And that takes about 10 days. Although the adults live for a few weeks. They don't, they don't die immediately like some insects. Uh, sorry, I should have... Uh, I forgot to... Uh... So... Um, uh, where do we keep them? 
And uh, the Genetics Department of Fly Facility has got four culture rooms. And uh, this is a look into one of them. And, uh, uh, and you'll see that uh, there's these little vials in trays uh, all the way along these shelves. And uh, there's another wall here. And um, if, um, if this was full of vials, uh, it could probably keep about 20,000 vials. Uh, and this is where our flies work. Uh, you can see the little vials uh, here on the, on the, um, uh, on the bench top. Uh, bottles if you want larger numbers. Um, and um, and uh, various uh, students and postdocs and, and, uh, and technicians uh, working with them on these uh, little dissecting microscopes. They're fairly low magnification uh, microscopes. And of course none of that would be possible without uh, the kitchen where we make their food on an industrial scale. Um, at its peak, uh, this was churning out about a, uh, the equivalent of about a million vials of fly food a year. It's gone down a little bit since, but uh, it's still fairly, fairly impressive. So that's a little bit about how we work with flies and where we work with them. Uh, so um, how useful are they? And um, uh, flies and humans uh, lasted a common ancestor. The date isn't quite certain, but the best guess is probably around 600 million years ago. Uh, and at that time, it must have been in the ocean. Uh, and uh, how much of its features do we still have in common? So I won't do an exhaustive list, but I'll just give a few examples. And uh, this is one uh, uh, example of one organ system that is found in both flies and humans, the digestive system. Um, and uh, we've both got salivary glands, we've both got an esophagus, we've both got a stomach, uh, we've both got an intestine, um, and a few other bits and pieces uh, as, as well. And, and uh, if you want to, if you want to uh, draw it for schools, uh, if you Google it, you'll find uh, uh, a lot more uh, answer, a lot more examples as well. From my good, good friend and colleague, Andreas Progop. Now, it's not only what you might call the um, uh, basal functions like the gut, but um, um, this is a, a picture of two flies courting. Uh, you can uh, see the male here doing his courtship song with, with one wing, and uh, the female deciding whether to run away or, or give, give a go at it. Uh, and uh, and uh, if you think about all the the sensory and motor processes and processing that involves, it's quite a lot. Um, the male has to recognize that he's seeing a female. He has to recognize it's a female of the same species, that he's not wasting his time with uh, one of the other hundreds of the softless species around. Um, he has to um, uh, start to try to court her with the, with the wing beat. Um, he has to chase after her. Uh, and eventually he has to mount her and mate her. And uh, conversely, the female uh, has to know she's been courted by, uh, uh, by a male, uh, by a male of the same species, so she doesn't waste her time either. Um, and, uh, and eventually, whether to mate with him or give him the brush off. And that's affected, for example, if the female is a virgin and has not mated before, eventually she'll succumb to his advances and mate. Whereas the, if the female is not a virgin and has mated previously, um, she will be very resistant uh, to, uh, uh, to mating. So, um, all's fair in love and war. This is an example of war between uh, two male Drosophila. The two ones doing the fighting are, are two males. You put them in a, in a small uh, um, environment with a female to, uh, to uh, compete over. They don't look very vicious, but they, uh, they, uh, they can be.
Okay, someone in the audience, I think, was studying cognitive psychology, so I'm sure there's a lot of cognitive psychology in there. But um, um, so, uh, so where there are common mechanisms, um, there are also common diseases. And, uh, and I hope this works. So this is an example of, um, there's a set of diseases in humans that I'll come on to uh, shortly uh, called hereditary spastic paraplegia, where patients progressively lose the use of their lower uh, body muscles because the longer spinal cord axons degenerate. And, uh, and there are a lot of uh, genes that can cause that, uh, uh, that disease. And uh, most of those genes you also find in flies. And uh, this, is this is one of the genes here where it's, uh, it is uh, mutated and it's defective in flies. And on the top is a wild type normal larva. It's crawling along uh, the, uh, the surface very, um, uh, very happily. Uh, whereas this is, the, um, uh, this is a larva carrying uh, the same kind of mutation as causes paraplegia in humans. And you can see this front end uh, works okay, but it has to drag its, its back end behind it, just like in, in, in the human diseases. So let's go back to uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So, um, so how do you study those diseases? Uh, how do you study what, what goes wrong? Uh, so, um, uh, one, uh, uh, so one way is uh, to make mutations that affect those, uh, those genes. Um, this is where uh, the scale uh, of the work you can do with flies comes into its own because the fruit fly has um, got about 13,000 genes in its genome. So in other words, 13,000 instructions for individual components of the fly or individual proteins. And, um, and we could um, potentially um, uh, knock them out one at a time and activate them one at a time and study what uh, goes wrong. And, um, and um, we could do that potentially in the space of this room because this room will hold about 20,000 uh, stock, actually 15,000 on this wall and about another 7,000 here. So, um, um, so we could um, potentially, if we wanted to, um, uh, in this room, keep one mutant stock uh, uh, mutated for each gene in the uh, in the genome and, and study uh, what goes wrong. So the title of the talk was about axons. Uh, what I want to move on now is having introduced you to fruit flies and what you can do with them and why they're so good for genetics. Ask uh, uh, what can you do with them to study axons. So I want to look at what axons are and, and uh, uh, a bit about how they can go wrong. So um, uh, I mean, axons can be, can be quite short, but the longest ones uh, can be um, uh, 10,000 to 100,000 ti 10, 100, times longer than the central part of the cell, called, called, the, called the cell body, which is where the nucleus and all the instructions are and where uh, lots of the components are made. And um, if, you, um, if you think about um, uh, a cell body in the brain with a um, diameter of a few tens of micrometers, uh, in other words, a few hundredths of a millimeter. Uh, the axon can be a meter long. So um, that's a bit like this room. I guess this room is probably about five meters, five meters long or so. Um, and um, if, you, um, if you had a neuron on the same scale as, as this room, and this was the cell body, which is where the instructions are um, and, and uh, uh, the, the headquarters, the axon is like a corridor going out there and leading uh, probably all the way to London. And, uh, and so that axon, uh, that, the sheer length of the axon, um, and also the sheer volume of material it, it contains as well as length, that means that you require a lot of engineering to keep that working, to keep that corridor working, or to keep the lights working, keep the power sockets working, uh, keep things moving back and forth along it uh, as, as you need, um, uh, keep it swept, um, keep it free of clutter, keep people from dropping things in it and, uh, and, and not clearing them up. So that's a lot of machinery that's needed uh, to do that. 
So that's just a, uh, an example of the, the, the scale of, for a talk I once gave in Istanbul, that, that the uh, axon, uh, with a large electric theater, the axon wouldn't just go to the airport, it would go all the way to Athens or Anchor. <coughs> uh, excuse me. So, so what are the kinds of diseases that you might expect to see if uh, that engineering goes wrong, the engineering that you, that you require for long axons? And, um, and uh, the, um, the type of diseases, uh, I forgot to put in the picture, uh, but uh, of, the, um, of, the type of the patients. But um, the, um, uh, the, um, one example of the disease is something called hereditary spastic paraplegia. It's a, it's a, a class of motor neuron disease, um, but it's not usually as severe as, as the normal, uh, really distressing form of, of, of motor neuron disease, where um, uh, you're... Uh, you can be dead within a year of being, being diagnosed or within, a, within a couple of years. So it's not, it's not, as, it's not usually as, as bad as that. And often uh, uh, I've gone to conferences uh, where there have been patient representatives there, arrive at the conference, uh, come as dinner in the first evening, you're sitting around the table um, and you're talking to people and, and you don't know who's the, uh, the, uh, the scientist and who's the patient representative. It's only when they get up that you see they, they need walking sticks or walking aids. Or wheelchairs to uh, to get around. So it's not as severe, but but actually having uh, um, having been to the annual meeting of the UK um, spastic paraplegia support group uh, last year, you can actually see uh, although it might not be as distressing as um, as uh, the classic motor neuron disease, it's certainly exhausting and it takes a lot of it takes a lot of energy out, out of uh, both those individuals and their family to 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 to, to get around, and and they, most of them they can stay working for a while, but eventually they have to stop work because it's just too much um, uh, energy and effort to to commute and get and get upstairs at uh, at, at work. So um, so how do we study what goes wrong? Uh, the um, uh, as I um, said in the first part, genetics is one way, and genetics means uh, finding. Uh, mutations that uh, that cause the disease, and I won't go into in detail how that's done, but um, uh, but just uh, say that um, in uh, by uh, by trying to identify the effect of genes in patients like that, and the, and, the, and um, especially in families of, of patients, uh, so far uh, there have been about seventy different genes identified that can that uh, can cause the disease, and that's a lot. Suggests that there's quite a uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. With, uh, with, with long axons, which isn't uh, 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 um, uh, a big surprise. And uh, more genes are being continued to discover. There's a new gene appears in the literature once every few months. And so that means that there are probably a lot more still to discover. Um, so each gene, uh, sorry, each mutation in a gene disrupts one specific protein. And it's the proteins that are the nuts and bolts and cogs of the cell that, that, that make it work. So in one mutation, one mutant, uh, stock one protein uh, is wrong, and, uh, and to understand the disease mechanism, you want to know what those proteins do. So finding the gene is only the start, but at least finding the gene allows you to make a start on on on, uh, on uh, understanding what the protein does. Until you have the gene, it's actually very difficult to, to start working with the protein. But once you have the gene, you have the protein. You you can study um, what uh, uh, the protein does and what goes wrong. So those 70 cause of genes encode 70 different proteins. And although at first sight, uh, there are, uh, they encode um, a lot of different types of proteins, um, one thing in common is that many of them are found um, on membrane um, structures inside the cell. So you can probably imagine that, that, uh, that uh, each cell in our bodies is surrounded by a membrane. But uh, in addition to the membrane that surrounds the cell, there's lots of structures inside the cell uh, that are surrounded by membranes as well. Uh, little um, bags of of uh, um, of, uh, of chemicals or, or structures that uh, that do particular parts of metabolism um, and that have to be do done uh, in their own little compartments. So those are surrounded by membranes, and, that, and as those membranes, we find a lot of the um, the, uh, the spastic paraplegia proteins. And I want to look at at one type of membrane in particular called uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Don't worry for too too much what the name is. Um, reticulum implies a network. Um, and, it's, and a network, it's, it's, um, uh, so it's a network of these little sheets. Um, so that's like a sheet surrounded by a membrane with a, with a hollow part in the middle. And uh, it extends uh, throughout the cell. And, uh, and um, through biochemical approaches, 
it's been discovered that, um, that um, a few of the um, proteins that are affected in the disease, what the normal proteins do, not, not what the mutant proteins do, but what the normal proteins do, is they insert into one uh, face of the membrane, of the endoplasmic reticulum, and by inserting into one face, they distort it and, and, and make it, uh, and, and curve it, and thereby uh, give it its shape. So, so these proteins, it's, it's about four different uh, proteins, there's actually more now. Um, for example, if, you, if enough of them insert, it will, um, it will um, induce the membrane to form a tubule, which needs a lot of curvature, uh, or um, it will induce curvature at the edges of these sheets, which, which requires less curvature. So, so, so these proteins um, uh, uh, play a big role in giving endoplasmic reticulum, giving this organelle its shape. And, and so the question we've been looking at is, what has endoplasmic reticulum shape got to do with axon maintenance and axon degeneration and the disease spastic paraplegia? Because the connection is not immediately obvious. And, and, um, and, and so, um, uh, so the first question is, is there endoplasmic reticulum in neurons? And uh, although um, uh, I still get asked at many conferences I go to, is there endoplasmic reticulum in axons? Uh, because uh, it's, a lot of people are not even aware it's there. People think of endoplasmic reticulum as being in the center of the cell where the proteins are made. And then the proteins are, are transported th throughout, the <coughs> uh, throughout the cell. And that's, there's a lot, there's, uh, that's most of the truth, but it's not all of the truth. Um, and if you look at axons, um, this is, uh, and, and, and the green, uh, this is not our work, but it's, a, it's work from, uh, from uh, a lab in Chile, uh, where the green staining here is a, is a reconstruction of electron uh, microscopy that shows uh, an axon, which is the, the hollow part uh, in the middle, uh, stuffed full of these tubules. And, uh, uh, and, uh, um, and so this, um, um, uh, and so um, uh, that has been seen by people who looked hard enough for it uh, since the mid 1970s, and um, and I don't know if anyone is doing a PhD in Babraham, uh, Babraham Institute, uh, but uh, they're one of the famous pioneers of calcium signaling uh, in the Babraham Institute. Mike Berridge um, uh, coined the term a neuron within a neuron for endoplasmic reticulum because it's a continuous tubular network. So just like the neuron is a, is like a, has got a long tube of its axon, inside that uh, there's another tubular network and that's the endoplasmic reticulum. And because that's continuous all the way from uh, say the input uh, part of the neuron through the cell body, through the axon, through the output part of the neuron, um, potentially its physical continuity uh, allows signaling of, in some way to go along uh, that structure as well because of its physical continuity. How it might do that, we don't know, but at least the, the, the potential is there. So, um, so, that's, um, uh, so that's an introduction to endoplasmic reticulum and what it might be doing in axons and why it might be important for axons. The fact that it's there um, doesn't tell you why it's important, but, but the fact that it's there means that the cell goes to a lot of trouble to put it there. And so one presumes it must be doing something important there. And, and also the fact that, um, that um, mutations in spastic paraplegia genes, which are involved in shaping this or organelle, um, um, that those mutations also cause degeneration of long axons, that, that connection smells of an important role for, for this structure in maintenance of axons. What exactly the role is, uh, we cannot, cannot tell uh, yet. Uh, but um, uh, but that's what uh, that's the uh, the model that suggests it, and that's what we've been setting out to test over the last few years using 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 fruit flies. The the model that that um, uh, that um, um, uh, that ER tubules in axons are affected by mutations in spastic paraplegia genes. <coughs> So that brings me on to the third part of the talk. And so we have, um, and so we have um, made, um, a lot of our time is spent actually in making the right flies. Uh, for example, flies that have lost particular genes of interest, or flies that are carrying particular, or GM flies that are carrying uh, particular 
um, um, uh, engineered copies of genes. Um, this is an example of, uh, of we have made flies that are lacking uh, uh, one or the other or both of, um, of um, um, the fly equivalents of two spastic paraplegia genes. And, um, and what we do is we, we, um, uh, we, uh, we take flies at different ages, um, bang them down uh, in the vial. Sorry, I should have brought a few along with me, but I was just, I was just uh, uh, busy interviewing all day. Um, so, uh, uh, the, uh, so you bang them down in a tube and, um, and then uh, count after, uh, uh, say, 10 seconds or so, the percentage of flies that have reached a certain point uh, uh, um, in, the, in the vial. It's a, it's a fairly crude measurement of their locomotor uh, ability. And what you see is that, um, uh, I mean, don't bother um, trying to understand everything. I'll try to explain the main points uh, verbally. That uh, as the flies age, normal flies, their locomotor activity gradually decreases with age, just like ours, except theirs declines faster. Um, if, you, um, if you knock out one of these genes, or the other of these genes, uh, you don't really notice much of an effect, but if you knock out both, you see that uh, initially the locomotor activity is normal, but they decline faster. And again, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to um, uh, over, overdo the parallel, because there could be lots of reasons for it, but at least superficially, that's again similar to what happens in a neurodegenerative disease, that, that initially things work normally, uh, but uh, as, as it ages, uh, 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 things slow down. So, so how can we study axons? And um, a lot of what we do, this is the, the prep. Um, uh, this is a, this is a, um, a larva in a pinned out shape on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the operating table, where we, we take a, a larva that's about five days old. It's, uh, it's about four millimeters long. And we, uh, we cut it open along its back, and we pin down the two sides on, onto, uh, uh, onto uh, a plate. And, um, and we just get rid of its, its, um, uh, its, uh, most of its innards. And, uh, and what's left is uh, the, the central nervous system up here, uh, two brain lobes which are kind of a bit, a bit blurred, and the ventral nerve cord, which is the equivalent of our spinal cord, which only goes back a little bit. And then they're transparent here, so you can't really see them that well, but you could, you could nerves going all the way along the body wall. Um, short ones going out to the muscles here, long ones going out to the muscles at the back. So we can look at, so we look at short axons and long axons. If you label them with, uh, say, green fluorescent protein, um, which uh, was uh, one of the things that uh, partly, it was part of the, um, um, part of what uh, Roger Chen, who used to be a graduate student here, uh, got the Nobel Prize for, along with, uh, with uh, other colleagues, um, uh, a few years ago, if you uh, if you label the axons with green fluorescent protein, you can actually uh, see how they how they project. So again, you get short axon. So we can study both short axons, and we can study long ones. So we can compare them in, in the disease. So so what if we uh, so what if we um, uh, look more closely at at some of these spastic paraplegia mutants and flies? And these are looking at uh, at non neuronal cells uh, where um, but we just looked there to begin with because it was easier to see endoplasmic reticulum there. And, uh, and uh, in, in the normal flies on the left, uh, you can see short sheets here. Um, and we recognize the endoplasmic reticulum because of their, 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 their um, characteristic appearance. Um, but if you look at the, at the mutant, you see that the, uh, the sheets are expanded. So that's, that's, that's again consistent with what we, we would have predicted. Um, either that, um, for example, if this protein is normally involved in forming tubules and it's missing, then the tubules may have to form sheets instead. Or alternatively, um, if, if, um, if, this, uh, if the protein uh, here on the left normally causes the edges of the endoplasmic reticulum to, to curve and you remove it, it can't curve them as much and so the sheets have to expand. So, so, so far so good. Uh, that's what we expect. Well, what about axons? And, and here uh, we're looking at, uh, we've labeled um, axons with a, a particular protein that we can detect by antibody, and we're labeling, a, and we're labeling like, like um, if you go back to these, these bundles here, we're labeling a, um, uh, two axons in each bundle. There's, there's about 80 axons in there altogether. All and, uh, and so what, 
uh, what we see is that uh, in, um, uh, in um, normal larvae, everything is fine, the, the, these two actions look continuous. I mean, sometimes they run together and, and, and you can't always, uh, uh, you can't always uh, prize them apart. Um, when you take away, when you take away uh, the, these uh, spastic paraplegians individually, you don't see much of an effect. When you take away three of them uh, at the same time, you start to see what looks like fragmentation of endoplasmic reticulum. So, so, so that's one of the things that we're really most excited by. Um, I should say uh, we don't see it in every larva. It's only, uh, it's only what's called partly penetrant, uh, but at least we're seeing it. Uh, when we don't see it in, 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 uh, in, uh, in wild type. And so that's telling us for the first time that these proteins are involved in organization of endoplasmic reticulum in axons, which, which, which uh, uh, before people had kind of predicted and supposed, but, but, uh, but not ever seen. Whereas here, here, we're seeing it. <clears throat> now, um, this is uh, using a light microscope. A light microscope isn't really um, a high enough magnification to tell us what's really going on. And so, uh, and so uh, one of the things that uh, we've done uh, uh, recently, uh, together with colleagues, with a colleague in um, uh, University of Connecticut uh, Health Center, uh, is to do uh, electron microscopy, which is a much higher magnification, uh, cutting a cross section across those nerves. So we see all 80 axons here. There's, there's, a, there's a glial cells around the outside protecting it. And uh, each of these each of these circles here is, is an axon. Uh, you can see various blobs inside each axon. But the one thing I'll draw your attention to is little spots here. And, uh, and if you uh, just start the movie, and, uh, and if, you, if, you try to, uh, if you try to just uh, keep your eye on, uh, um, so remember the, uh, the big, cir the, well, the circles here that, are, that have got a dark line outside and are light in the middle. Each of those is, an, is a single axon of a single nerve. Um, but these dots here, they're stained. Uh, here they look like dots, but uh, if you go through sections, they're actually, you can see they're tubules because, they, because a lot of them are continuous. So I just start the movie. Uh, not all are continuous, but uh, enough of them are that you can hopefully follow them. So each step is uh, 60 nanometers. So the whole thing goes uh, for about six microns. That's probably a lipid droplet there. And if it do the same thing again, I don't know, can you? Do it. Let's do it again. I can re replay it afterwards if you if anyone wants. So that's so that's a normal. And, and you see, let's see if we can see. Like there's okay, there's a few there that you can tra see for quite track for quite long distances. So um, so if you look at that, uh, every axon has them. And uh, um, and so I think that's actually the first time where anyone has, has really uh, systematically looked, I mean, okay, we haven't looked at central neurons, but at least there um, uh, we see that every axon has, there might be the occasional section where we struggle, is it there or is it not? But, but, uh, but pretty much every axon has, has them. And the smaller ones have, um, uh, have at least one, uh, the larger ones have got, uh, have got more. Now, what about, our, what about our mutant? I don't know, can anybody see any differences already? Apart from there, it's a little bit uh, darker. Forget, forget the, how bright it is. Think about what might happen if you're, uh, if you're losing proteins that are necessary for the curvature of the membrane. What, what, what are your predictions? Sorry? It's getting more like a slice. I don't know. The shape is different. Uh, no, not necessarily the shape, but. Uh, the distance. Sorry? The distance. The di what distance? It's not long. Uh, uh, so what would that cause? What? So what would the consequence of that be? So it won't reach enough areas? Uh, yeah, so you might expect gaps. OK, any, any other predictions? You wouldn't have as many because they'd be more like There are fewer of them. Any other predictions? Open up? No, they wouldn't open. They can't open up because the membrane has to stay continuous. But it's like you're losing curvature. They're not as curved, so. Yep, the big, bigger diameter. So, so I think you can, you can actually, I mean, even by eye, and, and actually we've measured them, and, and you can see, but even by eye, you can see that uh, the tubules here tend to be larger. 
and we've counted them, and there are fewer of them as well. So, so, so remember, so look at here, here's a few. They're not all this big, but here, here, uh, here. You can actually see, you can actually see uh, the internal part, whereas in the previous one, uh, it just looks like a, like a dot. You can't, the, the internal part of the tubule is not big enough to, to see in, 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 the, in the normal axons, but in the mutant axons, uh, it, it's often big enough to see. So the diameter is increased. So, so that's what you expect if the membrane is less curved. Uh, you also expect fewer than that. Now, are there any? Um, now, the, um, I'm trying to spot. Um, now, most axons still have, still have the tubule. But if you go through, you will occasionally see an axon. Let's see if you can find one. There is one there, um, which actually, I mean, it comes and goes. But uh, sometimes there, it's back again. But um, let's, let's try and find this guy. Again, is that, is that him? Yep, there. You can see there's quite a, quite a few sections where the, the tubules disappear. So, so like you were saying, it's not... Uh, it's, not as it's not as long, so translated uh, to what we're seeing here uh, means that uh, th there are parts of axon without, without any. So, so again, that's showing that that uh, that um, um, that uh, sparsely paraplegia uh, uh, proteins can affect the organization of um, of um, ER in axons. So, uh, so one question is, how come it's not gone? A lot of it's still there. It's got the same shape, and so the the, um, the um, prediction is that there must be uh, we haven't hit anywhere near all the genes that that are that, that are putting it there, and so there must be more genes out there. How how do you find them? And come back again. And the answer given twice already during the talk. How do you find new genes that affect process? Sorry. You try them all. What do you mean you try them all? Well, you can't change them all at once, but uh, you can you can one uh, at a time. Uh, one or you can try to change them one at a time, or you can you, you don't necessarily have to change them yourself one at a time, but you can uh, uh, you you could do that in flies, uh, but th th these are th but if you think about the human diseases, um, uh, you can't change it in humans, but you, what you can do is you can do you can screen large numbers of humans, so like like here, and and um, and effectively. Because this is a, a, a quite a debilitating disease, uh, that means that you get doctors worldwide who are effectively screening human populations for 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 humans with these diseases, and and uh, if those are being um, and, and if those are integrated into uh, say um, medical research operations, then um, then um, um, uh, then they can uh, make their way um, into the genetics and finding the effect of gene. I won't go into the details of how you find the effect of gene, that will be another talk. Uh, but, um, but um, and, and for example, um, this was about two years ago in, um, in, in science, in a single week, there were about 15 new genes uh, reported for, for, for the disease just by, by, from screening large numbers of, of, um, of affected uh, patients. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so what we can do now is uh, these are the human genes. Um, most of them have a fly equivalent gene. Not all do, but most of them do. And so what we can do is, in flies, we can start uh, making mutant flies that lack each of these genes and ask, are they affecting axonal ER? Because not, uh, they, they're not necessarily all affecting axonal uh, endoplasmic reticulum. They could be affecting all sorts of things. We don't know that. Because identifying the gene is only the start. Uh, we have to find out how it works. But now we can actually test in flies if you, if you take each of these genes in turn, uh, are they affecting uh, endoplasmic reticulum in axons? And the last slide, um, I want to think a little bit into the future because, uh, because um, finding out that uh, these uh, genes affect uh, axonal endoplasmic reticulum, again, is only the next step because it doesn't tell you why the axons are degenerating and what's going wrong with them. Actually, it tells you that these genes are doing something important in axons, but it doesn't tell you uh, what, the, um, uh, what the problem is. And, uh, but, but, but however, the fact that we do have mutations now that are disrupting the continuity means that we now have a tool. It's not a perfect tool yet because, as, as I said, not every axon 
shows that, 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 uh, uh, that effect. Uh, it would be easier if we had additional mutations where we could see the effect in more of our axons. It would be easier to study. But, but in principle, what we can do is, is um, we, we can make flies where we, see, where we have discontinuities in this network within the axon, and we start to study the physiology of the axon, what, what, uh, what goes wrong. Is it, is it uh, calcium signaling? Is it, is it uh, oxidative phosphorylation? Uh, is it um, uh, lipid signaling or biosynthesis? Or we, we, can, we have no models that we uh, uh, would like to test. So um, this isn't quite complete, but it uh, because uh, of a, a new uh, person in the lab. But these are people past and present who have contributed most to the work. Um, so the um, the um, uh, mutations were were made. Um, and some of the other uh, stocks, like the fusion to, to a green fluorescent protein, were made by a uh, postdoc in the lab several years ago, Martin Stefanko, who supervised a number of, uh, of uh, undergraduates to do it. So the paper we're writing up, these undergraduates made the mutant, sometimes in a summer project, sometimes in a part two project. Uh, they made uh, mutants that we're using, so they'll be co-authors on the paper. Uh, Neve uh, Sullivan was a postdoc uh, who, um, who did... Uh, who did um, um, uh, some of the work on, on one of the genes, and um, a lot of the, the, the analysis, the most recent analysis of phenotypes was done by, uh, by someone who just, uh, I, she now, um, she's now um, just been, uh, she's got through the degree committee um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think she goes through the Board of Graduate Study, she says maybe today actually. To get, so if, she, if it was today, then she, she, she's now a doctor. Uh, like, uh, and uh, Lulu, uh, who's been in the lab for about a year, um, and uh, is working on screening new genes. Um, uh, Anud, uh, who um, uh, is a PhD student, just gone into her second year, um, and uh, who is uh, trying to find new uh, fluorescent markers for, uh, that will allow us to look a lot more easily and faster at, uh, at endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, to the people who funded them all, and, uh, and if you have a... If you have a vote in the EU referendum, one thing is that uh, if, there was no, if we're not in the European Union, this would be gone. This would be gone. So. So. Okay. <clears throat>